<laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to Love Boat, a healing circle with John Waddell and Susan, also known as Sark. We feel so blessed to have you in our circle of this very radical healing space that we're creating together to get to hear a story of two souls. And I love, love, love that they are in their engagement journey and that they're getting to learn their life lessons together, right? This is what it's all about. So we just feel so blessed to have you all here and to hear your story. And I know that everybody who's gathered in our circle just feels blessed to be a witness to your badass beauty. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. Oh, thank you. Talk oh, to us. Talk to us. You. Thank you. I, oh, thank you. I want to introduce to you um, Dr. John Waddell, my beloved, my fiance, my co author, my co teacher, my beloved. And um, of course, there's so much that can be said about him, and I'm actually going to read from our brand new book, which is not out. These are the printer's proofs, so it's unbound. It's unbound. It's an unbound book. The pages are leaping out. Can you show um, the yes. I'll show you the cover. Succulent Wild Love. Six Powerful Habits for Feeling More Love More Often. And it says at the top, a new philosophy of love and relationships for everyone. And the day this book was completed, the next day John was in the hospital with this diagnosis. So I'm actually going to turn it over to him in a few moments. We're going to have a dialogue. We're going to talk. And John's going to share. Um, but as part of the introduction, I thought I would read just a few pages from the book. Um, it's a section that's handwritten. Well, there's all handwriting. It's, it's a very innovative book, as you might imagine. I wrote in here, you might understand this is not a normal book. Um, and I have a section in here called Let Me Introduce You. So I'll just start reading here. Um, well, let's see. It's, uh, all right. The one subject I had not yet written a book about was love. Specifically, love with another person in addition to me. I married myself in 1997 and promised to never leave me. I wrote about it in my book, Succulent Wild Woman, which is my statement of self-liberation. This new book is my statement of love and relationship liberation. It's about the best of being single with the best of being in a relationship and how to actually create that every day. I'd like to introduce you now to Dr. John Waddell. He's my co-author, my very first one, my life, love, and adventure partner, and my most beloved. When I met John in 2012, he told me that he'd been happily married for 10 years and that the honeymoon had never ended. And his wife, Jeannie, had died in 2011. John had grieved and opened himself to loving again. When we first met, John said to me, I want you to know that I'm qualified to adore you. I felt married to him in that instant. He also said, you're obviously a very talented, unusual, and creative woman. What I'm going to say next might shock you. What I appreciate most about you is that I know that you're normal. You're normal in the sense that you're a woman who wants to give and receive love. I started to cry because that's what I most wanted to share with another person and had felt too scared to be seen and loved in that deeply intimate way. My life and career successes were immensely fulfilling but couldn't fill my desire for that kind of loving relationship. John has a PhD in clinical psychology, is a metaphysical teacher and author, and I experience him as an embodied joy being. I'm so happy to introduce him to you in this book and in my life and on this love stream. It's larger than our personal love story, and it goes on from there. But um, John, thank you. Oh, I love you. Well, first of all, I want to thank Shiloh and Dory for setting this all, creating this beautiful experience. And uh, I have Jonathan, who's behind the camera, who set everything up. This magnificent space here, uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful. That's all I can say, all the artwork. Um, I feel honored to be here. Uh, I'm happy to be alive. <laughs> you know, most people who go to stage four cancer uh, go there because it's their ticket out. And um, 
at first, before I even knew that I had this level of uh, illness, um, I was aware of feeling ill. I hadn't been diagnosed. But both my mother and my wife Jeannie and I uh, really ha have never been sick. This is very new to me. And uh, in both my mother's case and in Jeannie's case, uh, we had they had completed books, and shortly thereafter, uh, they left. And I was thinking, you know, is it my turn? Is, is this the path out? Is this why I'm doing this? Because I'm not used to being sick. And it took me a while to clarify that and realize that they really were finished in many ways with the things that they wanted to do. And I had this amazing, and I have this amazing opportunity to teach with this book and to teach with Susan. And so I am very, uh, uh, I was able to clarify that. And by the time, uh, it, my illness was very much intertwined with the book. I look at illness not so much as something that happens to us, but as something that we create. Um, my view is that our, our body is our most intimate creation. You know, we see all this artwork here, you're going to be doing some wonderful artwork. But every day, you are creating your body. And I also do not see our body as betraying us. So then the question is, why would we want to create an event that is so painful? Why would anyone want to create that? And of course, the answer is no one does. Um, but when I talk about the fact that we create our illness, our illness is a message. Our illness is a solution. And my view of it is when we find another solution, we don't have to use illness. But this brings us to a very, very important point that, that most people shy away from these concepts because it's, it feels like blaming the victim. And the way I look at it is, in the 1940s, no one knew the correlation between high-fat diets and heart disease. And so people happily ate bacon and uh, whipped cream and butter and you know all kinds of stuff. And 20 years later, they might have a stroke or heart attack, and modern medicine would be able to say to them, you, you know, you, you contributed to this, to this big time by the fact that you ate all this high-fat food. But of course, the people had no idea. They had no way of connecting those dots until someone did the research and was able to help them. And that is how I feel about this. Most of us do not see the power of our thoughts. We have not been taught that our thoughts are powerful in terms of creating our physical experience. And so we go on and we think and we do and we follow along what uh, uh, our authorities in our lives tell us. And then one day something happens, poof. And so to blame someone in that case is really crazy. On the other hand, uh, when you have someone who's been eating a high-fat diet, to withhold that information from them and say, you know, okay, you survived the stroke, or you survived this heart attack, it would benefit you now to get on certain drugs, it would benefit you now to eat a lower cholesterol diet, a lower fat diet. And that's where I see the value of what I'm talking about here. If you have any kind of illness, I can almost guarantee that you were not able to connect those dots. Okay? But you do have a value opportunity here once you understand that you can shift your thinking and actually move yourself into a more healing space. Just the same way as someone who decides to reduce their high fat diet. Now that doesn't mean you're going to be skilled at this. You know, I've been studying metaphysics for 40 years uh, and I'm having a heck of a time, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but just having that knowledge, that awareness, that it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a developed skill, and anything you can do along those lines will benefit you. And you don't have to be master at it, um, and you're going to run into lots of bumps if you choose this path. I, can t I call this conscious, uh, we talk about spontaneous healing, I call this conscious healing. When we talk about spontaneous healing, what, what happens is that the, uh, the medical establishment, establishment cannot explain what happened. You know, if they say, well, we, we gave you some chemotherapy and you got better, they can deal with that. 
But when someone draws uh, some of the things that you're going to be doing here today, and suddenly gets better, the medical establishment is dumbfounded, you know. Uh, and so they call spontaneous healing. What I'm doing is a little bit different. It's conscious healing. In other words, I looked at what was the solution I was creating. Now, I will say one thing. Uh, because I've had, I do know how to connect the dots between my thoughts and my experience. And I did blame myself at the beginning. Um, and, but then, there was a shift. When uh, I started seeing this as a mountain I was climbing, as opposed to a ditch I was flailing in. And once I realized I was climbing a mountain, and you know, you can have somebody who's tired and hungry and, and uh, cut up and stuff like that, and if they're climbing a mountain, they're like, wow, you know, I'm climbing this mountain. And once I began to look at it from that angle, it became very powerful for me. And Susan can speak to some of that also. So, so for me, the uh, emotional blockages were very much tied into our book. I see this as an extremely powerful book. And anytime you have something that's ex extremely powerful, it can hurt and it can heal. And I had some false beliefs that I was terrified I would hurt people with this book, or I would hurt myself with this book. I literally had messages saying, you will die if you finish this book. And so when we were writing in December, uh, I started getting muscular pain around my core. And on January 5th, our first draft, which is close to a final draft was due, that day I got shingles. And I proceeded to lose 40 pounds, couldn't figure out what's going on, what was something, maybe a stomach irritation, we didn't know. The day that we finished the book, on July 5th, is when I went into the hospital and got diagnosed. So everything for me was easy to see that it was entwined with the book. And the analogy that I use that really helped me is I was not allowing myself to go where my heart was leading me. My heart was leading me to, to produce this wonderful thing, and I know it's going to do amazing things. Um, but I felt so guilty and so afraid, I wouldn't let myself go. So my analogy is like going down a beautiful four-lane highway, and everything is smooth, you know, zooming along, and all of a sudden there's a huge block. And a uh, giant traffic jam, nobody's moving, you know, what do you do? Now, in most instances in my life, when I run into these kinds of situations, I, uh, I step back and say, what's going on? I need to clarify this. And I did try to do that. Uh, I was never able to fully clarify it. And so, basically, in my analogy, what I did is, this book is so important to me. It's so much what I want to do. I took my car off the road, into a cornfield, and started driving forward. In other words, I was creating internally cancer instead of externally joining the joyful journey that was available to me. So that was one big aspect of it. Another aspect is when we were writing the book and doing the business together, uh, my inclination has always been, I'm there, whatever you need. That is, Susan laughs and calls me her ready man. But what I was doing is I wasn't paying attention to my own needs. What I was doing is saying, whatever needs to be done, I'll take care of it. Um, and so, since I've had this cancer experience, I realized I wasn't listening to my body. In fact, I would sit in pain in front of the computer and not, and, and not stop. I was using pain as a boundary. And so, anyway, I got those, the understanding of those three things. And, and I, I have, now I picture myself flying over over the, uh, the blockage on the highway, ending up at a bookstore where people love me, people know about me from the book, there's a lot of Susan and me, our personal experience, and, and just feeling that love. And once I started feeling the love from everyone, and the love I felt towards them, all those fears dissipated. It was amazing. Now I had help, I had professional help to get to this. I couldn't get to, to it by myself. And the second thing was to recognize that I have a choice. I can step back and say, uh, I choose to do this or give me a moment. I'm not just automatically going to say yes to anything that is asked of me. 
And of course, the third thing is the pain thing. And if you if you fight, I stop, and I don't just say yes. I don't have to use pain as a boundary. So I'm very clear that on everything to me, from my perspective, happens on inner levels first before it becomes physicalized. I am healed on that level. I have no doubt about it. The energy that created the cancer um, is no longer there. However, having created it, there is momentum. And one of the things I've been learning, well, there are two things, and these, these will be useful to you, especially the second one, is even though on the larger scale, I've been able to understand the, the psychological blockages, the psychological conflicts, they're not completely gone. So about a week ago, uh, Susan and I uh, uh, had been scheduled, I've been scheduled to participate in a weekend uh, seminar and when I saw that I was scheduled for much of the weekend, my reaction was almost immediate. I was tired. I couldn't eat anymore. It, over the next three days, I could hardly walk. It was insane. I thought, what is going on here? Is it, the, it never occurred to me to connect the dots. You know, I thought, oh, uh, is it the chemotherapy coming out? You know, so the chemicals are still coming out of me, and things like that. Again, once I was able to connect the dots, and be able to say to Susan, hey, this is too much for me. And we were able to work it out. Uh, and and it, we ended up with a joyful solution, which was wonderful. And, and I realize now, this is not like a one-time deal. It's like, I have been using the illness to protect myself. Because I can easily say, oh honey, I would love to do this with you this weekend, but I'm just too tired. You know, if I have the energy, I'll do it. And I can use my illness as an excuse for a million things. And that is one of the, the things that is important to understand. If you do have an illness, especially if it's something that's long term, it becomes entwined in your life. And once you begin to use it for anything, you have to consciously disconnect and say, is there a way that I can resolve this problem without having to be sick, without having to use this as an excuse? And so that's what I'm working on. And, and again, I'm, I'm a very aware person. You know, I have a PhD in psych, I've been studying metaphysics, and all of us have blind spots. I have a blind spot. Susan's helped me. You know, Susan has her own. And so, <laughs> basically... But you were going to say two points, are you getting to the second well, one? Well, the second one yeah. is that if you're using it for anything. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because I know, because I love when you said, uh, the second one, which you'll really be able to use. Yeah. So I was waiting, yeah. and so, then I was like, wait a minute, which is the second so, one? So be aware, uh, from my perspective, and you don't have to agree with this, you know, I'm not positivizing, this is my view, this is my path. You have your own path. But from my perspective, the illness is a perfect expression of who I am. It's not an accident. We joke about it. It's not like cancer falling out of a tree on top of my head, you know that I created exactly the path that I'm on. And that's how I see it. But that is a very powerful position. Once you understand that it's not your fault, you are innocent. But now you have an opportunity to begin to shift. And again, I would say be gentle with yourself because this is a learned skill. Even if you just have a little understanding that, hey, hey, I've been using this illness and it's an excuse, Maybe I can just stand up and say, you know, whether I was sick or not, I really don't want to do this. Can we figure out another path? And that will begin to lighten that. It will begin to allow you to float up. Can I add in, honey, um, when you said you were afraid you would hurt people with this book, um, I just want to sort of explain, or have you explain a little more what you meant by that. that that in your psychology practice, you were meeting one-on-one -on -one with people what? and you could guide them if you saw them going astray uh, or somewhere else. And the books were going out into the world to unnamed, unknown people who could misinterpret or you know have, have hard times in their relationships as they tried some of the principles. And then feel like a failure or something and then feel worse. Yeah, so you... So we you came up with, with 20 things, that ways I could hurt. People. Yeah, and one of them was that somebody is reading something out of the book to somebody who's driving, and the person driving feels guilty and runs off the road and kills themselves. So that was the most dramatic. But yeah. we, we did this 
as a as a practice of you know the inner critics are very strong. You know, you heard John say he had he was really a group of inner critics that said, if you produce this book, we will kill you. And inner critics are strong. And if you're not familiar with inner critics, I, I want to reassure you, everyone has them. They're not bad. Although I'm saying this very dramatic thing that they said they would kill him. But, but the truth is, they're trying to protect you. And they've grown out of proportion to what you need. And so yeah. there, there's ways to work with and understand your relationships with your inner critics, and in fact, transform those relationships. And so we talk about that in the book. But I just kind of wanted to come back to that. Yeah, and so let me just clarify. My inner critics weren't going to kill me. They said I would die, and oh, they right. were trying to protect me. Right. So. Um, right, good point. Thank you. So, I had them killing you. <laughs> right. So where I am now is, is um, I'm having some setbacks emotional setbacks, I'm clarifying them. Each time I learn more, each time I bounce back better, uh, I'm still quite weak, you know. I understand that we're in a time-based reality, so just because the inner clarity is there doesn't mean that I immediately am healed. Uh, some people have that ability, I don't. Um, so I'm doing it more slowly. And um, now today, for all of you here, you have a wonderful opportunity to do spontaneous healing. You don't have to understand all of this. You can just allow your inner guidance to help you create a work of art. All you really need is two things. One is a desire to heal, a desire to shift your life. And the other is an expectation. And we, we have, you have some really powerful teachers here. And if you can ride on the energy, and develop an expectation that if you follow and, and get connected with Source through Shiloh and through Sark, uh, that this will guide you to healing. It will guide you to healing. You don't have to understand the stuff that I'm trying to uh, figure out. If you want to, you, you know, that's a wonderful thing to do. But you, you can easily find yourself being healed. As Shiloh has said, that people have been healed before. Riding on that energy that Shiloh and Sark are going to connect you to Source in a way, in a vivid way that you weren't aware of. And then be aware as you begin to heal, not to use any remnants of your illness as an excuse. Be aware if you become afraid that all of a sudden you're healthy. You know, my counselor said, what if you had no cancer today? And I went, ooh, I don't know. I don't know if I could handle that. Because again, I was using it. Uh, so we all have, all have our different experiences. Uh, did you want to talk about caregiving? Uh, how's our time? <laughs> We're good. Okay. Uh, let's see. What can I what can I say? I said earlier about caregiving. Um, you know, care living. I I, I started. I, I realized like the the physical acts of caregiving that I'm doing now was in the beginning very resistant. You know, I don't want to have to do a bunch of stuff. You know, how come I'm in this position? I mean, you know, I also didn't want to go into, uh, I'm, I didn't want to start over-functioning and doing more than my body could handle or, and, and I really learned, and what I want to say is, if you're doing any kind of caregiving in your life for anyone, for any reason, that it's even more important to keep self-love very close at hand. And so, and the, you know, you heard me say I was giving up ideal caregiver to be idea caregiver. So that means I've been looking for all different ways of doing things, accepting help from people, quitting certain things, doing some things really badly, doing partial things, um, changing up the order of everything. Oh, you know, let's do laundry next week. Um, who cares if the dishes are dirty? Uh, they can pile up. Um, these are all just simple things, but it's really a feeling sense of I'm, I'm a partner in my life with John, and I want to do whatever is for both of us that will make our lives more nourishing and easier. And so I was able to drop my anger and my resentment, and I was able to just move into a space of love and a space of, of willingness and a space of non-resistance. And that just feels so much better. And speaking as someone who resists a lot of things, uh, I initially resist. My first thing is like, no, you know, let's not do that. And so it feels much better to, to open one's arms and say, 
what is there here for me? Um, so John has said now that uh, you've experienced me as a wonderful caregiver. Um, but not an over-functioning one, because I'm not denying my own needs. I'm taking good care of myself in the midst of taking care of John, in the midst of John taking care of himself. So it's, 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 very, um, it's, it's been very illuminating. Um, and anything else you want to say? Yeah, uh, well, I want to go back to my path for a minute. If you're yeah. yeah I'm so a, I don't care. I mean, <laughs> the, uh, one of the most powerful things you can also do for yourself is to focus on things that you appreciate and bring you joy. The more you focus, you know, again, I come from the law of attraction. The more you focus on anything, the more it becomes amplified. So if you focus on things that bring you joy, even for five seconds, ten seconds, then you're not focusing on the illness. And uh, the more you do that, the, the body's natural tendency is towards health. Source, God, whatever you want to call it, is on your side. And it's really a matter of working out whatever needs the kinks. And then your body can flow to the healing top. And so, again, one simple way is to just, as much as possible, I know we talked earlier about it's okay, go into the fears, of course. Uh, but then, at some point, don't stay there. Move out, understand the fears. Soothe yourself. Give yourself statements like, anyone can heal. I've seen other people heal. Uh, I've got so many wonderful things coming into my life to support me. This is a perfect example of what's happening today. And to remind yourself that you do have support, you do have love. And, and then go and focus as much as you can on those things that you can enjoy. This is so amazing. I want to hold this book up. <laughs> you. <Here. laughs> um, and just say, what a powerful book this must be. <laughs> I gave my review already. Um, that yes. it, it has this much danger associated with it. <laughs> because in our world, which is often driven by madness, when you create an alternative that's really powerful, there's often obstacles. There are mountains to climb. Because you're really saying something countercultural. And it's not very popular. But we're going to make it popular because we're actually choosing that this is the way we want to be in love now. We've seen how relationships are going. We've all been in them. We've all had all that stuff that isn't working. But this book, which is going to be coming out very soon, which is so brave to continue the book experience during this, is going to be such a witness for your love relationships. And it's designed for people who are in love relationships, but also people who are individuals who are cultivating love within themselves, or who are calling a love, be love being to them. Six powerful habits for feeling more love more often. A new philosophy of love and relationships for everyone. Succulent, wild love. Oh. So um, I, I think that the legend, you know, at Cosmic Calvaros, we're all about transforming your life into a legend. And when I think about the legend of the story, so sto for me, story, making something into a legend, is what moves the energy. That's where the healing comes from me, because I get the juju out of it, I get excited. And it's a combination, we call it, of fact and fiction and poetry. Because you make some stuff up. Like, if you're not feeling good and you're saying, I'm, I'm healing myself, there sometimes can be a mixed message. But when you bring it into a story or a legend, the legend of this book, that this book created, that the book wanted to create in some way, is just really amazing. And I think it's going to go down in our history um, as something that, what, like what you've done in your life, is going to change people's relationship to loving. And then being asked by this creation to do this work together. It's just really powerful. So I just want to honor you and thank you for doing it. And thank you for letting us be a part of it. And of course, when it comes out, I would like you to purchase many copies <laughs> of this book because this is um, this we is did not we did not discuss this. <laughs> no, no, this is me. This is the power of community. This is the power of healing and of working together and of being a community, witnessing how we're changing our thoughts and our minds from how things have been being done. This is radical. This is revolutionary. This is different. This is a different kind of love, and you get to be a part of it. And probably you're already feeling it as I am in my heart. I still. I feel that combination of wanting to cry and wanting to laugh all at the same time. So thank you so much um, for 
just giving us, giving us this opportunity to be witness to the process and to be, I loved how many references you made to like, I did that work, that is, I am, there's like that healed, cured thing, right? Where your physical body is still going through the journey that it's going through, but this is a healed man. And if we can explore that as human beings, regardless of whatever we're going through in our world, what a different place we get to live from, from each day. So thank you for being our teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. <laughs>